Good morning. I saw that uh, Greg had the communion meditation this morning. I went and asked Amy, I said, did you help with that? She said no, and I went, okay, thank goodness. I didn't want to follow her. There was a young man that decided he wanted to go west to see the frontier, so he made his way west. And he came to a point where he was in a lot of trouble. After several hundred miles of traveling, he really didn't know where he was going. And he had a hard time finding food. So after almost a week of really not eating much, he was in a lot of trouble. So one day he stumbles across this grapevine. Oh, he sits down and he's eating the grapes and they're big grapes, there's great big clusters. And he praises God saying, thank you, Father, for this perfect gift. Fruit is one of those things that really demonstrates the wisdom of God's creation. In fact, before he created man, he created fruit-bearing trees with fruit on them. So when he did create man, there was already something to eat. In fact, it was the only diet that man had for a time. So fruit is a pretty special thing that really demonstrates God's forethought in his creation. Today, we eat fruit for several reasons. We know that it's high in nutrients, high in vitamins. Uh, what else does fruit have, Dash? It's sweet. That's one of the reasons why we like to eat the fruit is because it's sweet. You don't have to convince a lot of people to eat fruit. There was a very special fruit that God made that he put the tree in the Garden of Eden and he told man to not only eat of all the trees, but to eat of this fruit. And that fruit came off of a tree called the, the tree of life. When mankind fell, God said, we're going to have to get him out of this garden, him and his wife. We have to get them out of the garden because they know good and evil. And if they continue to eat this fruit, They'll live forever. Can't have that. So he runs them out of the, the garden, and they're not able to eat that fruit anymore. Subsequently, they're going to die. Fruit, again, was special because when you look at it, not only does it provide those nutrients, but in the vast majority of the cases, those fruit have seeds. And those seeds then can be used to perpetuate that tree, which will produce more fruit, potentially forever. So, again, when you think, man, God really thought this out. Fruit is really a special thing. In Galatians 5, let's see if I get this right. <laughs> uh, look, I work in the technology world. I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> I honestly, I can... I don't know sometimes but in Galatians 5 as, as Tommy was talking this morning about the Galatians Paul has to set them straight about some of the things that they are being taught by some of the people that have come in and said not only do you need grace through faith in Jesus Christ but you also need the law of Moses and if you're not doing both well, you've got a problem and Paul here says no the law of Moses is is flesh you're not going to be able to keep it grace through christ is freedom you guys were called to freedom why are you going back into bondage so he says to them again in chapter five so i say live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit is what is contrary to the sinful nature they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit 
is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such. There is no law. In this passage, Paul is explaining to them that there are two paths you're going to take in this life. One or the other. One of those is the flesh. One of those is in the spirit. What he tells them is each of us are going to have produce. Each of us in our lives are going to produce something. Now the works of the flesh are in direct contrast with the works of the spirit. They couldn't be more different. And what makes them different is where they are sourced. What's causing them? Where are they coming from? The works of the flesh all come from pride, selfishness. I believe that while money is the root of all kinds of evil, in my opinion, pride, human pride is the root of all evil. When you look at all of those things, I think about 1 John 2, 15 through 17, where John says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If a man loves the world, the spirit is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they are not of the Father. They are of the world. And the world and in the lusts of it are passing away. But he who does God's will will live forever. What he is saying there, John, is saying that all of these sins have a birth in temptation because of one of those three things. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. If you look at all of those behaviors, those acts, all of those are sourced because we have a desire to do something different than what God would have us to do. We have a fleshly desire that's inherent in us to do things that are against God's very nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, those things happen because in our mind, we think we're being held out on. God is not giving us what I really want. Murder, you know what, that guy's got to go. That guy caused me grief, he's got to go because I felt bad. What I think is interesting is some of the things that are listed in the same breath as sexual immorality, murders, jealousy. Jealousy is listed among some of those things. Dissensions, like what we were kind of talking about this morning, factions. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Those things are among some of the things that are listed with the evilest things that a man can do in this life. They are all works. They are all things that we do of our own accord to achieve an end. We want something at the end that is contrary to God's nature. We're going to work these things in order to get to that end. Paul then it explains that the opposite of all that not walking in the flesh, but walking in the spirit, he calls those fruit. He doesn't call them works, he calls them fruit. And I think the reason that he calls them fruit is because so much of the, the behaviors of the flesh are because of the flesh, but when we come into Christ through baptism, when we come up out of the water, Acts 2 says we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe that that means that the Holy Spirit is going to come into our life and it becomes the source of what we do in our life. It is no longer the fleshly desires, the issues of pride that is going to motivate us. It's the Holy Spirit. And it's our response to the will of God and his desire for us to live in the nature that he has. I love that he calls it fruit because... What do you, what's the purpose of fruit? Come on, somebody speak up. What do you, what? Sweet. Well, it's sweet. You eat it. That's, that's the purpose of fruit is you eat it. You don't just look at it. You eat it. That's what it was meant for. In fact, like I said, it was the first thing that God gave to Adam to eat. 
when we look at those things, those are things that are meant to be consumed. We consume them as well as others. So when we're producing, when the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, and we are looking at our lives and saying, this is what God's nature is. This is what I need to be doing because I want to be like God and in his workings. Those are the things that are going to come out of us. We aren't going to do these wicked things because God has taken the place of the pride and the selfishness and the lust that are in our life. When we do these things, when we show love to one another, when they, people look at us and they see, man, that guy is going through something, but I can tell there is joy. When that guy is, you know, being treated poorly, he's not responding negatively. When somebody is harsh to them, his response is gentle. When people see that, that's kind of what we want them to see. We consume the fruit in such a way, am I walking around too much? You're good. When, when we consume the fruit, it's because we look at it and we go, I wouldn't have done that before. That response would not have been something that I would have responded to that behavior or the way I was treated or the things that were said. That's not what I would have responded to in that way before. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, these are the fruits that are going to be produced. And in such a way, we're going to think later on, I remember, I remember that the last time I experienced this, I was able to produce because I remember the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. I remember. And when we do those things, not in a prideful way, but we think God is working. That's exactly what it's supposed to be is God working in our lives. Yeah. I feel good when you do things like that. Don't you feel good in like your very soul? You feel like, man, I am so, I have so much joy that I did that. I, 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 I just feel better in my soul. I feel nourished. So not only do we consume it, but like I said, others are going to see it and they're going to consume it. Like I said, with fruit, there are seeds in it. And when others consume that fruit, they're going to get the seed. And in getting that seed, that's going to be planted in their heart. And I believe that God will begin to work on them. God is going to work with them in their lives. It may not happen right away. And it may not be that seed. That causes a change. But I honestly believe that when we are bearing that kind of fruit, that, that kind of thing is going to make a mark in people's lives and go, I want to know what his deal is. I want to know why she's like that. And that seed is going to be in their heart, and it's going to be God's opportunity. If we had not produced that fruit, they would not have consumed it, we would have missed our opportunity to do as God has asked. We know that God has asked these things. In John chapter 15, Jesus is, followed, is discussing with his followers. He's on his way to the cross, and he's really kind of pouring out his heart to them and giving them kind of his final instructions. And in John chapter 15, he tells them, I am the true vine. You are the branches. He says, every branch that produces fruit, the Father will prune. Those that don't produce fruit, he cuts off. He gathers them up, and they're thrown in the fire. What that tells me right there is, God is expecting us to produce fruit. That's, for lack of a better phrase, a command. This is what you are meant to do. This is why you are here is because you are meant to go out and produce these things, knowing that people seeing these things, they're going to want to know me because of you and what you're doing. So understanding that, what are we doing? Are we demonstrating these things? 
if you don't feel like you're really going out and showing the world these things, look at where Jesus is in your life. Because the closer he gets to the center of your life, the more abundant you're going to become in producing fruit. Can't help it. You just can't help it. Because as Jesus gets closer and the divine nature is now indwelling you, that's what's going to happen. You're not going to be motivated by what's best for me. You're going to be motivated by what's best from God. That's really the source of all of these things is how close to us, or how centered we are with God. I miss very much my friend Dorothy. I miss her a lot. I wish that Dorothy could have met my wife. Because they would have loved each other. Dorothy would probably tell you that my visits to her just were meant, she meant so much to her. I don't think she ever really appreciated how much her love, her kindness, her peace, her joy, her patience, her goodness, her faithfulness, her gentleness. I don't think she ever really appreciated how much it built me up. How much it edified me to be around her. So not only are we supposed to produce fruit so that that kind of thing can happen in our life and as well as other people's lives. We need to consider that it's like a, an orange tree out in Riverside when it's August and it's 800 degrees and the wind is blowing. And you look at that tree and you go... There's not a lot of oranges on that tree. We need to understand that sometimes we are going to be like that orange tree. When we're suffering with things that are just difficult in life, even when God is at the center, we're still going to struggle with producing fruit. But that doesn't preclude us from it. And we should really appreciate the fact that when we're producing the fruit in the hard, difficult times, those are the sweetest and most nourishing fruit to everybody else that's going to consume it. No doubt. Because that is going to be the fruit that really sticks in their mind. Man, this, this girl is going through some stuff. And yet she is still bubbly. She is still, she is up, up, up with life. Why? That's why. Because God is at the center of her life, and she is still working to produce that. Sometimes it's hard. <clears throat> we need to be careful about the motives of our fruit. Tom told the story, and I'm going to tell it. Sorry, he didn't tell it up here. It's a whole story, so, you know. You had the chance. <laughs> Tom has this uh, this pomegranate tree in his yard, and one summer, like towards the end, it was getting towards the end of the summer, and there was like one pomegranate left on it. And he's looking at it. And he goes, "I think that's going to be a pretty good pomegranate." So he's patiently waiting for this pomegranate to finish growing. It's getting bigger. It's getting redder. He's licking his lips, waiting for the day. Finally, the day comes, he takes it off the tree, he goes in, he cuts it in half, and it was rotten in the middle. I don't know if there were tears shed, but there was much disappointment, right? <laughs> Consider your works and where they're coming from. Because even the fruit of the Spirit is our works, but they're coming from a place where God is motivated. That's really the, the place where these kind of things are going to come from. Beware of your motives, because it's going to make a difference. In that short parable I told, the, the, the settler guy, he says, thank you, God, for this perfect gift. It was a perfect gift. 
because he had not planted the grapevine. He had not watered the grapevine. He had not driven the pest away from the grapevine. He didn't prune the grapevine. He did nothing, and yet there was the fruit that sustained his life. Something very, very similar has happened for us. There is a perfect life-saving fruit, life-giving fruit, that is there for the taking. It is there for the taking. We have not planted. We have not watered. We haven't done anything for that fruit. It was already done for us. When you look at the things of Jesus and the kind of life that he lived and then subsequently the sacrifice that he made, perfect fruit. Perfect fruit. And not only will consuming that fruit be like the fruit from the tree of life and give us eternal life, but again, there's a seed in it. There's a seed in that fruit. So when we consume that fruit, that seed comes in and it plants within us that same tree of life that will produce fruit with seeds in it. And then as we go out spreading the gospel and we're being fruitful, there's that fruit for somebody else to come and pick. And since it's the tree of life, they can have that same fruit from the tree of life. They can have the opportunity to dwell in Jesus Christ and have that forgiveness. That's why it's important to show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because that's the first fruits. That's the thing that's going to make them go, oh, this is pretty good. Oh, wait a minute. There's another fruit. It's even sweeter. It's even more nourishing. In fact, it will perpetuate your life forever. Not your physical life, but your spiritual body. I hope that I've given you something else to think about. And if, you know, if you're a key on the keto diet, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but I hope that everything I said really helps you to understand where the center of your life should be and why it's so important when we're out living a life of living the gospel in our life. Really, I mean, the, the people that are knowing you and seeing you, they're the ones that are going to get most of this fruit from. They're the ones that are going to see guy's got it figured out. I need to know why. That's why it's important to get away from the fleshly desires and put the Lord back in the center of our lives. That's all I have this morning. Um, I guess I'll uh, close with a quick word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed, yeah? Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for such a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day because we step outside and we see the, the blue clear sky, we feel the warmth of the sun. We are truly blessed with fantastic weather, but we are also blessed in a beautiful day because it is, because it is the day that your son was raised. And it is that day that gives us the hope that we have. It is that day that will allow us to have the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. We know, Father, that it is your desire for us to live a life worthy of the calling. And that calling means that we need to go and share the gospel. We need to be those people that are producing the fruit of the Spirit knowing that that fruit is going to feed other people. It is going to build them up, not just believers, but everybody in the world. As we leave this place, Lord, I pray that that be the focus and the center of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.